This first gentleman needs very little introduction to our group. He is the author of the book, Get the Skinny on Silver Investing, available through Amazon.com. As publisher of The Morgan Report and SilverInvestor.com, he has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business, and BNN Canada. He has been interviewed by The Wall Street Journal, Futures Magazine, The Gold Report, and numerous other publications. With that, I'd like to introduce the silver guru, David Morgan. Always a pleasure to be in Texas. Uh, Texas resonates with me. I've only visited uh, Dallas a few times. I did a lecture here about two years ago with uh, Bill Murphy. Um, I get asked the main question, and Tarek invited me. He said, You know, he said, well, what do you want me to speak about? And I said, It wasn't my dog or my house, it was about silver and economy. So he said, Can you give us a rundown on where you think the economy is and where it's headed? that's what we all are concerned with in this room, and I've been especially concerned about it probably from a very early age due to the fact that I learned about how fractional reserve banking works at an extremely young age, and once you understand that truth, then uh, it will mess up the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for proof of that, but this is a video that you all, that I have, uh, that a friend of mine did. It's called The Day the Dollar Died. Before we start the video, I just want to make a couple comments. <clears throat> One of the things I'd like to say throughout my lecture series is the financial system as a whole. <clears throat> and human nature being what it is, is most people look for certainty in their lives. And there is no certainty in, in life in general, and there's no certainty in the financial world either. But there is almost one guarantee I can make in the financial world, and that is that every fiat currency has eventually died, every one of them. There isn't one ever that existed for eternity because it's based on a lie. You cannot print wealth. You cannot borrow yourself rich. And if you could, Zimbabwe would be one of the richest places on the planet. It's not. So with that almost guarantee, the idea that the dollar is the reserve currency of the world and it's in its final death throes, if you will, is of great concern to me. Because studying monetary history for as long and as hard as I have, it concerns me that this is the first time in world history that's a global phenomenon. And that should concern everyone. Because as the dollar goes, so goes all currencies. I get the argument quite often that, well, that's not true because our currency is resource-based. The Canadians and the Australians, for example. And certainly currencies fluctuate against each other, but they really are not a function of what they're backed by because they're not backed by anything other than politicians' hot air or the ability to talk them up. But the really function of this who's printing the most to get to and how the market sees that. But since the reserve currency, the backing of all these other fiat currencies is the dollar, which is a fiat currency. The ultimate truth is that they're all going the way of the dollar, eventually. There is one, actually two, that have stood the test of time, and that's the precious metals. So with that idea about the dollar, this film clip, seven minutes long, bear with me, it's called The Day the Dollar Died. Is it going to go with this extreme or not? I don't know, but I think it's a pretty good scenario that we see in our future, or at least how I see it. And you've asked me to speak, so I get to tell you what I think. <laughs> so this video is the day the dollar died. After that, I'll start my lecture. Some of that's actually taking place. Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is about the destruction of the dollar or the <clears throat> inability to accept the dollar's final payment. Uh, Russia and China have agreed that they will do trade and uh, directly with each other's currency, so they do not have to use the dollar as a middle middleman. Same thing with India and Russia. Uh, Japan recently announced that they were going to buy Chinese debt. And in this video clip, it showed <clears throat> where there was only three currencies that were accepted. That was the renminbi, uh, the euro, and gold. Uh, so it's not really that far-fetched, um, but we're not there yet. And I use the word yet. And uh, 
big end when this room actually has a responsibility to educate your friends and family and everyone you care about about what's really happening. I heard a gentleman earlier this morning, overheard him, I was getting a little water and he said how, how unaware most Americans are to what's really going on. This is the course we're headed toward, but it doesn't mean that we have to get there. We'll move on. Uh, silver's been moving up, it's also been moving down, it's starting to accelerate here in this chart. That's the website. What I'll point out is if you go over here, you can subscribe. There's different levels of service. Uh, I do consultations, um, and there's not much else to say, really. It's, uh, I think everyone in this room that sits there here probably knows about the website. It is my passion. Most of what I do, my bread and butter, people seem to always ask, you know, well, how do you make your money? And the answer is investing, probably number one. And bread and butter is still selling these ones. I mean, that's really how I earn a living. I, mean, I don't really get paid to speak that much. Uh, I earn a fee usually when I speak, but it's not anything to brag about. Which I don't mind, it's my passion. I like being in front of people and everything else, but the mainstay of, of the business is the core business. That's, that's it. Uh, <clears throat> when I started this study, I looked at uh, the next 10 years in silver. Silver done a good run from 2000 to 2010. In 2010, I asked the question, what would silver do over the next decade? And I really didn't know. So I pretended I didn't know anything about silver. I took out a blank sheet of paper as a metaphor, and I started to ask that question. And what I determined was that I am probably more bullish on silver than ever, looking at it from both aspects, as an investment and as industrial demand. I'm going to breeze through these pretty quickly. I think everybody in this room probably knows most of what I'm going to say. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm basically here for you. I'm here because you are here to see me and the other speakers. You have questions, and I want to open it up so I have more than five minutes left for your questions. I already caught like two or three in the hallway, and I said just please reserve them you know, for everybody's benefit. So, so there's so much going on with silver. I mean, it's got unique properties, as everyone knows. It's the best uh, reflector of light. It's the best conductor of heat best conductor of electricity, it's a natural biocide, and your higher end cars and cell phones in Japan where they're a little bit more uh, phobic about germs, you can have it in steering wheels and high end cars, you have it in high end cell phones. And the reason being is it obviously it kills germs. So when you're handling something with your hands all the time and you're holding a cell phone or steering wheel or whatever, it puts silver into those to prevent spread of germs. Flat screen TVs, all the stuff you guys know. But what's interesting is that all these are growing. Um, the cell phone situation is saturated in the United States, but not China. Home appliances, your high end uh, refrigerators and washing machines that actually have silver embedded in them. Clothing more and more uh, using silver uh, for various reasons. One is for odor control because of the biocide properties, others actually because it conducts electricity so well. There's shirts now that you can get that are uh, variable that will heat and cool you so if you know if I travel from Spokane where it's freezing I can crank that puppy up or I can walk the airplane not freezing and then when I get to Dallas I can turn it down and look up look I threw in a golf shirt yep sure did so anyway uh, solar I'll touch on this in more detail a little bit later but uh, solar is a big player uh, my background, as most of you know, is actually my first degree is engineering, my second degree is in business and finance, my passion, but uh, for the record, my first degree is aeronautical engineering, not that it really matters that much, but I also want to state that solar is not very efficient at all. I'm actually not a big proponent of solar, but I like it from the aspect that it uses a great deal of silver. There are applications where solar makes a great deal of sense, and that'd be here in Texas, for example, when you have big you know, cattle ranches, you don't have to run power, you can put up a solar panel and have an electric fence, and you know, that's a great application for solar. But to put them on your house or whatever, you know, I'm a little remiss to say, geez, I'd really recommend that. But that's out of my control because there's governments around the world that know how to run our lives for us better than we do. <laughs> uh, they'll tell you that solar is the way to go because if it's not green, it's not mean, and that's what we're going to do. So that's the trend, and that trend, I believe, will continue regardless of the recessionary environment or not. One of the big questions I get uh, is gold or silver. 
you know, and really, I think everyone should have both. I haven't told anyone at any time buy silver only. Some people that follow me do buy silver only. But I think really the older you are, probably the more you should lean toward gold, even though I'm a silver advocate. The reason being it's much more stable. It's sort of like buying a Dow stock versus a NASDAQ stock back when the stock market was stable. You, know. you have more volatility than the NASDAQ than you do in the Dow, generally speaking. That, that same analogy applies to gold and silver. But what's interesting is the truth. And the truth is there's a very large correlation to gold and silver. And I always get to, well, deflation or inflation or recession or, you know, what are they going to do? Well, you know what? We've been through quite a bit of anomalies from the year 1990 to the present. We've had our recessions. We've had our near misses with the deflation. We've done inflation. We've done all of this stuff. And look at that correlation. It's an 84% correlation. The only thing that correlates with gold 100% is gold. Nothing correlates 100% with anything. That is a strong, strong, strong correlation. So my argument is, look, don't think. The correlation is very, very strong. Is one as good as the other? Yeah, I don't know. You have to leave your house in a hurry. Even I'd buy a cup, I'd grab a couple of rolls of gold. I wouldn't grab all my silver because it's too heavy and I couldn't put it in my pocket. I mean, most people, not in this room, but most people in the general public have no idea of how precious these metals are and what the quantity that we're talking about uh, means in real terms. As an example, a uh, roll of gold is a stack about this high as 20 coins and 20 times uh, 1,700, you're looking at what, $34,000 a roll, right? So two of those would buy, what, 64,000 by Alexis, maybe not quite, but pretty close. And I could put two rolls in my pocket, walk around in this hotel, and no one would even know. I mean, they might flip my pocket, see if that's something in there. But there's no way to realize that that's 64,000 bucks. Do it in platinum, it's even more. You know, so this is the kind of value that gold has. But, if, you know, when I do the mainstream radio shows, people will say, ha, 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 you know, isn't it funny David thinks we should go back to a gold standard? Just think of all those gold bricks we have to take down and buy our bread. They don't get it. You know, they don't get the idea. They think that they have to take these massive amounts of gold to buy a loaf of bread. It's just the opposite. You have to shave off like that little speck to buy the bakery. I mean, they don't they get the whole idea backwards. But it's just an educational process. Most people don't understand that gold and silver have lasted throughout monetary history as well as money. One of the questions that is important to know is the supply-demand fundamentals of silver. And you know I'm going to, I speak mostly about the silver market, but I can take any questions on gold as well. I just focus on silver because I think the dynamics are better. I think it offers a better profit opportunity. <clears throat> but what we had from 1990, I know it's our from 1992, but from 1990 until about 2006, we had a deficit. A deficit does not mean a shortage. Deficit means the total demand is greater than total supply. And supply is not only production, it's also what the industry refers to as scrap. It's really recycling. There's all these negative words around silver. You notice that? Scrap, junk bags. You know, it's always these negative connotations. It's really interesting to me. So this deficit was met by the above ground supply. In 1990, the above ground supply of silver was about 2 billion ounces. By the time we got there, it was 500 million ounces. So between 1990 and 2006, we used 1.5 billion ounces of fine silver that was above ground and that meant went into investment for most of the industry. And at that point, According to both the GFMS and CPM, which do the two best studies on the silver market that you can find, I'm not saying I agree with all their numbers, I'm just saying those are the two best that exist, we went into a surplus, meaning that the total mine production and scrap were greater than the demand. Now, this demand fell off sharply, according to the GFMS, during the 2008 financial crisis, and it's coming back up. What I do know is this has to be pretty factual. And the reason I can say that is in the next slide or two, because <coughs> of the mining increase and the above ground supply. <clears throat> if you look at this chart, I apologize, this isn't really easy to read, but it's more for me to remember the idea so I can convey it to everyone. 
But if you look at around the 2000 time frame to 2010, we've got a pretty sharp increase in silver production. And the reason being is there's this global boom going on, driven primarily by China. And silver's a byproduct of lead, zinc, and copper mining. I got a quiz question. Who wants to win a silver coin? I better not do this because I'm going to lose it. <coughs> How much silver is a result of copper mining? What percentage? Less than 5%. 25% of the silver supply comes as a result of copper mining. Really? Yeah. How much comes as a result of gold mining? 13% of the silver supply is a result of gold mining. And the remainder of the 70s, so you take those two numbers, 25 and 13, and subtract it from approximately 70, that's the result of uh, uh, lead and zinc mining. So really, it's only like 25, 30% of the result of base metal, excuse me, primary silver producers. And primary silver producers produce lead and zinc. The only reason they're primary silver producers is because the big bottom line when they do their financial statement is most of their income is generated by silver sales. The most uh, correlated to the silver price, let me restate that, the highest percentage of silver only as a mining company is first majestic. It's about 90% silver, 10% byproduct. Anyway, back on point, had a big increase in supply. Now, when I did this study about silver and where is it going to go in 10 years, what I wanted to know was what I just showed you. Now, we've had a big increase in the mining supply. And I did a very kind of back the envelope approach. I didn't do a detailed analysis looking at mine by mine and that kind of thing. I just took the trend. And I said that we're growing about 3% a year, which is roughly 30 million ounces a year. And I'm assuming that we're going to be able to increase that amount over the next decade. And that's an assumption. An assumption doesn't mean I agree with it. It's just to base my analysis, OK? I totally believe that we're only going to be able to increase the supply at that rate for possibly a couple more years. And the reason I say that with such authority is 30 million ounces to be increased in silver supply is a huge number, huge. Now, we have had a couple mines come on that have these huge deposits. One is Pascalon, and that's about a 20 million ounce a year mine. But in order to increase at 30 million ounces a year over the next decade, you would have to find, build, and start producing a Pascalana every year for a decade. To me, that's impossible. Why? Because I know mine. I know how hard it is to find a mine. I know how hard it is to implement the infrastructure to build it out and start producing. But regardless of knowing all that, I still assumed you could do that. I don't think you can. But let's assume that you could. So if you could do that, we still have some problems, and the problems are that the supply increase would be 150 million ounces, but we're going to see in these further slides that the demand on both the industrial side and the investment side are greater than that that assumed increase would be able to produce. So I hope I said that succinctly. The industrial demand is increasing. Now, this is a projection. This is looking out 10 years. Am I right or am I wrong? We don't know, so bear that in mind. But I'm trying to be very conservative in my analysis because I don't want to, one, I don't want to be wrong, and two, I don't want to mislead anyone. But if we take the solar panels, you'll see it ramping up from the 2000s all the way up very quickly, which is true, and the data so far, so this was done in 2010 by Jessica Cross at the end group out of the UK. And pretty much these numbers are pretty spot on for the data that we know right now. And then she projects it's going to get to about 130 million ounces on an annual basis from uh, 2014 or so on. Food hygiene and water purification, huge, as you can see, and trending up. This is the solar only. Again, a rapid increase, and then it kind of levels off about 130 million ounces on an annual basis. So if you're increasing you know, the mine production by 30 million ounces a year, and you're going to have a demand increase, or a demand, steady demand at 130 million ounces a year, I suggest for your consideration how those numbers are going to match. Now, the, word, the water food purification required about 100 million ounces by 2020. 
and the solar application is 130 million. So that's 230 million ounces. Now what I did was I took those numbers. Now I think those numbers are probably large. In other words, I'd probably back them off. But Jessica did the study. I want to show you who did the study. I want to tell you I agree with it in theory. And more than theory, I think the application is probably correct. But to back it off and be as conservative as possible, what I did with that is I made the assumption that there will be no increase in consumer electronics, electrical power distribution, magro trains, textiles, or anything else. So it's all the applications that are still in growth curves, even during a recessionary environment. All the biocidal properties, all the medical applications, all the electrical applications, all the gadgets, gas, gadgets and gizmos in the electronic world. I'm assuming that there's zero increase for those. Well, I don't believe that, but I think it makes the study more compelling because what I'm saying is that the largest increases that we know about that already have large trend, we're going to assume they don't increase. And that, I think, gives us enough validity in this being a very conservative study. I also did it for another reason. The biggest argument I get continually is that when we're going to go into a worldwide depression, and a worldwide depression, when that happens, there won't be any need for solar. No one's going to want solar, and I'm not going to buy solar. I'm not going to invest in solar. And I said, fine. You know, anyone's entitled to their own opinion. I don't, I'm not going to take that argument on directly, but I'll do it indirectly. So I did this study, I said, well, you know, what's the most important thing during the Depression? Since I get to give the lecture, I get to tell you, you can argue with me later. But I would suggest for your consideration that the three most important things to human life are food, water, and energy. And those are the only things I looked at in this, in this study. Water and food, purification. Water purification. Food is mostly preservation. What they found is that our oil-based plastics, if they use nano silver in them and put them on top of your meat products, for example, guess what? They last long. They live pressure long. And they do last long. Because silver is a natural biocide. So even though no one talks about that, <clears throat> that's one of the applications. Of course, all your meat cutting facilities and all that, a lot of the surfaces are silver-based now. Now, I'm not saying every facility, most don't have that. Most of the meat cutters do have silver tip lights. It's a, it's a function of purity, you know. It's a function of keeping the surfaces clean. I mean, we all know what, you know, food poisoning is about. And that's why there's so you know, a little bit of silver used in lots of applications in the meat cutting industry and now in the packaging. And other products. If it works for meat, it works for vegetables, it works for anything that you see. But the ones that we're most familiar with in North America is the meat cutter, right? Where you see the silver tip light. So we looked at water, we looked at food, and solar is on trend. Now whether that trend continues or not can be argued. But right now, China has doubled their solar panel uh, production year over year for two and a half years in a row. And I think that trend will continue for a while. Until, as Jessica shows, it levels off in another year or two. So I think that's a conservative argument. That's how I see it. Investment demand. This is where it gets very interesting. How many here invest in silver? Raise your hands. Okay. Silver has become more and more mainstream. Gold really, it, neither are mainstream, of course, but between the two, gold is much more mainstream than silver. You see gold talked about on CNBC or CNN or any of the main financial channels. And very rarely they talk about silver as an investment, although it does happen in the time. But silver investment is pretty flat through 2006, April. And what happened in April 2006? And I'm not going to give away a silver coin. I know somebody in here does that. What happened? Where did we get this big jump? SLB. That's right. Who said it? Yeah, the ATF started right there. And what's interesting if we backtrack, we look at well, where did that start and how much silver started that? It's 130 million ounces, it was in London. It just so happens that Warren Buffett bought 130 million ounces and shipped it to London. And then the SLV started. He also sold it too. I oh, didn't mean it. That's what he said. <laughs> well, I know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. So that's where the SLV started. And then there's all these other ones. Now some of these existed before the SLV. And a lot of them came later. But the trend is we've got this big bump. Then we have almost a 45 degree curve here for a long time, then it's flattened out recently. 
But we have roughly 750 million ounces in the public domain and we can see it's being held as investment purposes. What I like to point out is these are all commercial bars. Everything that's in this domain here, all of these banks and holding companies and ETFs that either hold or claim to hold physical silver, that's all commercial bars that are usually used for industry, but they're being held for investment purposes only. And this is a lot of silver relative to the amount in the float. The amount that's in the COMEX here is actually up now to about 130 million ounces. Most of that is held for investment purposes only. This breaks it down. Uh, I'm not going to read them all to you. You can see that. Uh, the investment demand. Now here's where, on this chart when I made this about two years ago, um, it was active now. I have to back off a little bit. But the um, 300 million, 600 million ounces, that was 14% compounded. From 2010, when I made this, it said slower growth. And I just guessed at that. I've actually been right. It's basically flattened out. But we're still adding to the investment demand. I assumed at the time 100 million ounces of investment demand per year over the next decade. I feel that's very conservative, and I think I'm right so far. But the bottom line is the mine increase, remember, is 30 to 40 million ounces a year. But investment demand is three times that amount. If it holds. Well, maybe tomorrow, all right, Mark's a fickle. I mean, maybe everyone wakes up, you know, Monday decides they should sell their silver. I don't know. I doubt it. Um, conclusion. <clears throat> In my view, something's got to give. The investment demand, 100 million annually, has there been a good increase or not? I think so. I mean, there's a couple of funds that I'm working with that are going to do a silver-only fund, so that's more demand. The industrial demand, will it increase that much during a recession or depression? Probably not. It's something I failed to mention about a big depression. You know, if there is a big depression, the biggest thing that falls off is base metal mining. The copper, lead, zinc mining fall off substantially, which means what? 60% of the silver supply decreases as well. So it's sort of a self-regulating mechanism. People that complain about silver in a recessionary environment don't think about the market because they don't understand it. Silver is about the most misunderstood, misrepresented market out there, in my view. There's a lot of people that think they know something about silver because they've heard it somewhere but they really stop to think about what they're saying. Because the truth is, if we had a huge depression, it would be a huge fall of copper mine, which means it would be a huge fall of 25% of this. Let's say, as a thought experiment, let's say there's no copper mining starting January 1st, 2013. That automatically takes 25% of the silver supply out of the equation. Okay, so the increase uh, mining, I, I assume that, remember, that we're going to be able to keep chugging along for a new Pascal mining production every year for 10 years in a row. What this suggests is that we'll go back into a silver deficit probably by 2014 to 2015. I want to be conservative here. And a deficit, remember, doesn't mean shortage. We'll still have an above ground stockpile, but remember, price is the arbitrator between supply and demand. If there's a huge demand and the supply exists, it's the last bidder at the auction who buys the rent rent, right? That's how we are operating in a free market. And that would mean the price would be driven up higher and higher, especially if we have two demands simultaneously, which are investment demand and industrial demand. And believe me, silver is price inelastic on the demand and the supply side. I want to talk about that right now because I've got some time left. So let's take some questions. Yes, sir. If my numbers are off, turn this on. Uh, Please correct me. But sure. In the United States, we produce roughly about 40 million ounces of silver. Silver Eagle demand last year was pretty much everything that we produce. Okay. There's been a lot of talk, I think you mentioned it over the years, about, or actually more recently, about countries nationalizing their mines where they're literally holding their own metals. So if we get into that kind of a problem, do um, you think it really could 
get to a point where the U.S. Mint would literally stop producing Silver Eagles and the white, I mean, all the silver, because it's going to be needed elsewhere, which would cause the demand to go up even more? Do I believe that the Mint could stop many Silver Eagles sometime in the future? Yes. Uh, silver at one, silver is a strategic metal. In fact, at one time it was a strategic stockpile. Look at the word strategic, I mean, it's vital. Silver is actually a metal of war. I don't like to say that, but it's true. And that's the reason it was held in strategic stock. So any event that silver is needed in other, for other reasons by the United States government, I certainly could see them cur curtailing the program. I mean, no coin that's ever been minted goes forever, for two. I mean, it stops at some point. I think it could happen and for a variety of reasons. But yeah, I do believe that, uh, that that could happen. Do you think that the other countries, because of their investment demand, you know, Chinese and India and all, do you think that we will get to that point where the countries stop, stop exporting? I think China's quit pretty much exporting their own. China supply. was a net exporter for quite some time in the last few years. They pulled all silver internal with the mine and they also import silver as well. Part of it gets re exported because they smelt so much. But most of it's held internal and they do import it. Uh, do I believe that uh, other countries will hold on to their strategic assets? Absolutely. There's a book called Resource Wars, pick it up and read it. It basically, as this global empire starts to unwind further and further, people from nation states as a whole will look for what real assets they own, and they will cover those assets. I mean, if you own a property that has the metal in the ground, uh, why would you sell it for a piece of paper with somebody's picture on it, or a bond or something, when you might be able to get greater leverage by trading it directly? So I think that's the trend. Uh, obviously, we know for a fact that that's the trend when we look at what some of these countries have done. Look at Argentina as an example recently. It says, well, you can mine the heck out of our assets here. But that money that we make has to stay internal to Argentina. So there'll be all kinds of uh, ideas and roadblocks and windfall profits tax and who knows what. But the idea is correct that these countries will start to put roadblocks up for their assets that are real. And so that becomes, I think, the reason why they're going to see a commodity-backed uh, currency at some point in the future. Yes? What percentage of uh, domestic mining production is uh, foreign? What percentage of? U.S. mining is, uh, uh, mining, domestic mining is actually foreign. Because I was going through New Mexico yeah, how much of the domestic U.S. mines is a foreign element? And the answer is I don't know. But I do know what you said, that for example, the big copper mine in Utah, which uh, starts to be a, a senior moment, that's owned primarily by RTZ, or maybe Folio, or it's either BHP or RTZ, one of the big ones. I know uh, Augusta did is still going through permits. I know they had a huge Chinese investor in that. I don't know the answer, but I know that it's a great question. I wish I had the answer on the issue, but it's substantial, I'm sure. Yes. What are your thoughts on the uh, pricing of paper and physical silver? Pricing on paper and physical silver pretty much trend together until there is a shortage or a disruption in the market. We already saw it in the financial crisis in 2008. We saw a huge discrepancy of about 30% in silver. We actually saw about 10% in gold, where the physical market was at a huge premium to the paper markets. I think you'll see more of that in the future. I do think that um, the commodity markets are under a lot of pressure in a lot of different directions. One is to have more transparency. The other is this ongoing silver debate about whether the market's manipulated or not. And this ongoing study or evaluation on if there is manipulation or not yet to be resolved. So I think that there are really two prices that will be set at some point, the real market, the physical market, and the paper market. So I would be aware of that. Of course, that's something I study or watch constantly. But it doesn't really manifest that often, but it will again. Yes. Specifically on that, what's your opinion on the manipulation of the, of the uh, gold and silver markets? My opinion on the gold and silver market is that the long-term trend cannot be manipulated. 
Why? There's enough of a free market. Well, first of all, look at the facts. <coughs> so it's gone from $4 in 1990 to 35 now, as high as 48. So we got a you know, 12 fold increase. You can manipulate it for $4 today. <coughs> and it's not. So the forces in, in play are definitely with the free market over the long term. But within the short term, yeah, they manipulate the heck out of it. When you go in and you sell, 550 million ounces on the 29th of February and knock the price down 250. That's manipulation. Well, people say they have limited ammunition. Well, they don't have limited ammunition. It's no. unlimited. Because I've never created. said I've never said they have limited ammunition. I mean the opposite argument. I say that the trading funds have limited ammunition, and the banks have unlimited ammunition. It's like sitting down in a poker table where you have a billion dollars and I have a million. You know, the chances of me coming away from a poker table as a winner are pretty slim. And I have a printing press. Behind me. <laughs> yes. What's your thoughts on the XAU gold ratio? The, uh, like today, it's almost it's 9 to 1 or almost 10 to 1. The rule used to be you bought 5 to 1 and you sold 3 to 1. Then, you know, why is it so high? And is it because mining stocks are not analyzed the same way a mainstream stock would be? Or what's your thoughts on that? Good question. What's my thoughts on the XAU versus bullion, really? That's the question. A uh, couple, I'm going to talk over most people's heads, I don't mean to, I just have to show off a bit. It's two orders, of, it's two sigmas away from where it should be, or AB3, I think, which means that it's so, the gold stocks are so undervalued, it's almost screaming, you should just be buying them with both hands right now. But why? And that's the question I ask myself. I think primarily because the ETFs. Remember that a Section 7 license holder, a stockbroker, can only buy equity. They're not allowed to buy commodities. But the advent of the ETF allowed equity purchasers, money, managed money, fund managers, pension managers, and all those types to buy the physical commodity without any worry about analyzing the mining company. Because mining company has risk, management risk, location risk, geopolitical risk, the mining flooding, the labor strike, uh, transportation costs. How about an oil war? I mean, all of these things back during the, the analysis of the mining company. You have to mess with that. Buy the SLD, buy the GLD. So I, my hypothesis is that most the lion's share of that money has gone into the SL, into the ETFs, not into mining shares. But I'm more bullish on mining shares than ever, and I'll tell you why. Because when the next phase takes place, or the last phase, I'm not even sure what phase we're in, to be honest with you, but in the final phase where there's panic buying, people will buy mining companies because they're too lazy to get down to the coin deal. Prices will be too high. They'll see silver above 60 and gold above 2,000, and they'll say, well, I missed the boat, but my IRA is almost worthless. I don't have any equity left in my house, and I've got five years till I retire. And they'll try, try to play catch up. Remember the tech boom? Remember how those things went? Remember dogsandcats.com? No assets, no business plan, but it went you know, from three cents to 30 bucks in three minutes. That's what's going to happen in the silver and gold sector. Any worthless mining share that has gold and silver in its name will go on a rocket ride for a short time. There's a way to play it. We're working on it now. We're going to call it the uh, sacrifice fly strategy. We want to covet our hard fought for gains all the way up and put part those to the side. But I'm working on a strategy to take advantage of this. I'm also thinking about putting up a website and say this almost as a joke, but it's, you know, the stinky, scummy, Scrawny silverstocks.com and the fine print will be font that big that tells you this is high risk and these are stupid, you shouldn't buy them. But if you want to enter the website, but <laughs> probably <not gonna> do, <laughs> I'm probably not going to do that. But that's exactly what takes place at the top of these markets. I'm out of time, I have to leave early. I probably will not be able to be on the panel. I'm, I don't want to commit that I will or won't be. I probably won't be. I know that some of you probably have more questions, and the courtesy of the next speaker, I will walk out of the room. If you have to talk to me, I'll be back there privately for anyone that wants to see me. That, that's more important than the next speaker. I'm not saying I'm more important than the next speaker. I just want to give you the opportunity. We're not going to be that much yeah, longer. I, so I have a pretty short speech. If you want to take two more questions, I think we can probably handle it. It's okay. up to you. All right, two more. There's also that 30 minute break, mm -hmm. or 15 minute break. Thank you for getting in touch too much on mining stocks and stock uh, purchasing in particular, but I wonder if you would comment uh, in the, the fallout from the MF Global commingling scandal. Jim Sinclair was very vocal at recommending direct registration uh, and or physical holding of the stock rather than letting a broker hold it. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's an overblown concern, or is it something very real? Somewhat overblown, but you know that's an individual choice, and we've gone to great lengths to uh, put up a, um, a recommendation for all of our members that pay us. It's called Bulletproof Your Shares. It outlines exactly how you get the physical shares in your possession. That way they can't be shorted. As part of the membership of the Morgan Report at all levels, even the beginner level. So I'm not going to give you a big lecture on it, but it tells you it outlines exactly how to do it. So yeah, I think it's an individual choice. I used to do that personally in my in my youth, I did. Now I, I do keep them in the street name. Most of the stuff I hold is what I teach. Top tier cash for the trying to hedge my income is I can write options against. There's a gentleman this uh in this audit, in this place right now that I know follows more pretty closely and I think they do the same thing. Because I don't mind running my stock when it's over. It doesn't bother me. Okay. Uh, you, uh, don't, you, you asked one yet? Or nice. You get to it. Uh, going into the future and, and energy costs go up, which is going to uh, gold or silver would be benefit the most or, or would you say one or the other? Tough call. Even in, as energy price, as energy costs increase, which would benefit the most gold or silver? That's the question. Yeah. I really haven't thought of that. Um, I know it would be silver. The reason I think that is because uh, gold value per unit is so much higher. In other words, the ratio right now is 50 to 1, right? So almost all open pit silver operations are inefficient and energy prohibitive. And so they're only economically marginally profitable when you have lower energy costs. So any increase in energy costs go directly to the bottom line, more for silver than gold. For, let's do the experiment together. I'm just doing this in my head, right? <clears throat> an ounce of gold is $1,700. An ounce of silver is $35. So if you're going to get an ounce of gold per scoop of dirt, or an ounce of silver per scoop of dirt, which one is the most efficient? Gold, by far, 50 times more efficient. So silver would benefit the most because there would be less and less silver mines that were profitable, so they would go to the, to the wayside, right? And that would mean there would be less available to be produced at a profit. So that's what I mean. I think it benefits silver. Did you follow my argument? Yeah. Okay. But grams per ton is a big difference. Well, it is, but still, you know, a gram of gold per ton, which is some, some mines are actually operating at that, believe it or not. I still, it's hard to believe that they do. But you can never operate a gram per ton silver. No. Unless silver is the same price as gold, right? So that's the point. So I'm not saying, all I'm saying is that the silver would benefit the most, I'm sure. I mean, there'd be exceptions to that in a certain line or something, but no, generally speaking, no. Okay, so. Is that it? Okay, thank you.